Welcome to The Big Picture. I'm Phil Arno. All this week, we've been talking about our culture and what it's going through. There's been a shift in values, historical perspectives, and educational trends, just to name a few examples. The media has led us down a path of some of this change. For better or worse, America is not your grandfather's country. People recognize to a great extent that the media has an agenda. And yet, that's still where we get a lot of our information and opinions from, even as trust in media is at an all-time low. I'm sure some of what's been said on this big picture this week is controversial. Look, and I'm not here to tell you guys what to think. That's not my job. And really, it's not the job of anybody in media. What is our mission is to provide information, food for thought. And if done correctly, or if we can make some sense of what's happening, and just be honest, you can figure out where to go from there. Do some research. Think about what we've said, and, and do your own research and verify what we said. We bring on guests to just contribute to the conversation. And on this big picture, I consider we have a guest that's a home run. Dr. Brian Joseph is with us. He's a psychiatrist who was on the faculty of Harvard. And he was in charge of the Erie County Department of Health Services for 25 years. It's my pleasure to welcome to this big picture, Dr. Joseph. Yes. <laughs> welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you. Um, today I want to talk about um, in general, your experience with the criminal system and people who have broken the law. And, and one of the first questions I want to ask you is related to our culture. In, in the United States, we've gone through a cultural change since the 1960s. It's been a massive change, in my opinion. And, and things, according to the older values that we had, seem a little upside down. Police have been vilified. Uh, religion is kind of attacked, religion and priests. Uh, patriotism is no longer encouraged. Uh, government is there more and more to take care of us. We've even been told quite recently that if you took out a loan and if you use that money, uh, it's okay not to pay that loan back. These are changes uh, in our society that, well, the evolution of which is my my question is is crime in this country been accelerated along with or is it just one of the changes that goes along with this other phenomena well the easy answer to that is no uh, actually crime statistics have been falling for the last 20 years they're up a little bit more more recently but nowhere near the levels that they were so this notion that things are rife with crime is not true. Uh, there is social policy questions about bail, but I'm not going to discuss that per se. Uh, that's still an ongoing uh, conversation. But from a crime standpoint, crime is down. Uh, whether other issues uh, impact, you know, I, uh, I served in Vietnam as an Army flight surgeon, and it wasn't too popular when I, when I came home. And there were a lot of demonstrations, so hard feelings and divisiveness are not new in this country. Uh, they've been around for a long time. The question is, how do you begin to combat that and uh, talk with each other? Uh, you might be interested, as, as an aside, that when Ke Henry Kissinger was um, Secretary of State, Dr. Kissinger at one point entertained the idea of being a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And his thought was the way you negotiate with countries is to cool off the emotionality till you could get down to talking about substance. And it's too hot. We need to cool it down. And then maybe we can get some answers. Well, you know, in, in that answer, you tend to uh, uh, lead us towards the, the talking points that we hear from officials, from 
politicians and, and leaders and also the media. Um, the, if you listen to the things that are said over the air uh, and on the internet and, and from speeches of uh, our leaders, it would lead you to believe that divisiveness and hate and, and gun problems and all these emotional talking points, um, they're, it's much worse than what you just said it is. Well, the media, uh, you're in the media, <laughs> right? Uh, the media plays a role in stirring things up. And uh, I looked it up, uh, Tucker Carlson makes $29 million a year. And so the question might be asked, what does he get paid for exactly? He admits he's not a newsman, so he gets paid to stir things up. But even in, in, in deference to Tucker, there's 330 million people in this country, only about 6 million listen to him a night. So the fact is there's a lot of people spreading this divisiveness in an attempt to get a following, and I'm sorry to say, to uh, get elected. Um, it's not just the messages that we hear, but it's also the practices of the people. Now, whether or not there's a direct correlation, I'm not sure over the years, but you know, there's been such changes, again, it goes back to what I mentioned before, back in the 1960s, for instance, um, the divorce rate was maybe two or three percent. Now it's up around 40 percent. Um, Ninety-nine percent of Americans said that they had a religious preference. Now that's about 45 to 50 percent. Um, the uh, out-of-wedlock births, uh, you know, across all ethnic groups was about three or four percent or less back in the 1960s, and now it's up around 40%. Uh, th those things, there's a definite change, and, and I don't know whether we can attribute that just to the way we're being talked to, or whether there's another influence in society. Uh, it, do people just feed off of each other style-wise? Well, it, it's an interesting question. The divorce rate's actually 50%. So it's well, worse that, than you, than you <laughs> that's thought. That's why I'm not being paid $29 million a year. Yes. <laughs> but what's interesting is in the old days, it was very hard to get a divorce. And mm -hmm. so the notion was you should stay together no matter what. Well, people were very unhappy with that. Why they end up making poor choices is a whole lecture series in and of itself. Uh, as far as religion is concerned, one of the questions is that religion, unfortunately, is not solving the problems people face. It's not dealing with uh, climate change or income disparity. These are things to get inspiration from and to get direction in your life, but younger people are not finding that uh, something that can guide them what will guide them is uh, somewhat unclear, and I think that's an issue. But life has always been tumultuous in this country. In the 1800s, the issue was alcoholism. It was an enormous problem back then, and the same questions were being asked. Where's religion, and where's the family, and why are there so many, you should excuse the expression, so many drunks around? Uh, that was attempted to be solved by prohibition. That didn't work out. So whether things are contributing or not, you have to ask your question. The question is, are there sensible proposals being made, in particular by religious leaders, by elected leaders, that actually are taking problems and looking for real solutions not rhetoric or name-calling. Part of the change, and I alluded to this a little bit, um, and that is that government has taken over uh, a much larger role in society than it used to have, especially in this country. Um, 
the, the people who depend on government for housing, for health care, for benefits of any kind, um, it's grown. It's grown enormously since the 1960s. Um, if, if that is part of the problem, individuals taking care of themselves and senses of responsibility versus depending on an outside force. Um, is that something, first of all, is that part of the problem? And if it is part of the problem, what's the solution? That is a good uh, question. I'm at an age where I get social security benefits. Mm -hmm. um, which you paid into the system Which for. I paid into for many years. So uh, the fact is that before Social Security, people died in, in poverty, in nursing homes. With, uh, they starved to death. Or there, there were disease states. And Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal with the creation of Social Security literally saved people. The fact that you don't have six-year-olds working in cotton mills where we protect children, or children to have a childhood. These were all government solutions. These were not individual solutions. And there's always going to be a tension. Yes, people should make it on their own. But there's nothing wrong in giving people an opportunity or some encouragement or some opportunity to be helped to make it on their own. When I went to medical school, um, Nelson Rockefeller was the governor. We're going way back now, <laughs> the governor. And he felt that you shouldn't have to be a surgeon's son or a, you should excuse the expression, a uh, used car maker, used car dealer's son, mm -hmm. to be able to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. And so I got help with my tuition. And now kids come out owing $200,000 for a medical school education. It's a national disgrace to have to go to college under these circumstances. And the costs are enormous. It's absolutely unfair. Well, clearly there's, um, there's a role for government, but there's a lot of moving parts there, and I, I, I know people who would say that if government hadn't gotten involved in the education system and subsidizing loans and various things, the, the cost of education would not have skyrocketed. It wouldn't be nearly what it is today if government hadn't kind of guaranteed that you could get a loan or you could go to, go to school uh, and, and afford these increases. So there's, I mean, there's both sides of the argument. There is an argument, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say if, if, if that were the problem, you and I would not be having this conversation because I wouldn't be here right now. We've got about a minute left in this segment, but there are very definite advantages to some government programs, and there's no doubt about that. Things change when government steps in and there's a need for certain rules changes and certain government intervention, but there's always, always good and bad on every Well, that part's you know, true. Thing. So we're going to be right back after this. It's going to be an interesting uh, discussion. Stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm here with uh, Dr. Brian Joseph, and we're having a very interesting conversation about, um, well, we started out about talking about crime and criminals uh, in the criminal system. One of the things that I, we talked about just before the break, and I wanted to ask about, was uh, back in the late 1970s, I believe it was, in the Carter administration, there, there had been, and I think you referred to this a little bit, there had been some problems uh, in the mental health uh, treatment area where there were abuses for people who were who had problems who mental health problems they, they were committed and and abused in, in institutions and and that could be a real problem uh, f for the the human side of of, of people uh, you know suffering 
um, with good intention, the government got involved and changed certain rules and regulations as to how you could deal with people who had mental health issues. Um, and maybe oversimplifying it, but a lot of the things that we hear today uh, are connected with mental health problems, the shooting problems that, that occur, the homeless problems that occur. Uh, and it seems to be traced back to the fact that you can't get people assistance if they have serious mental health problems. You can't, for instance, I don't think you can have somebody committed for their own protection unless they agree to it. And that, again, may be oversimplifying it, but can you address that? Well, there were for a number of years, up until medications became widely available, uh, that people were housed in state hospital systems. Uh, with the result of medications and outpatient facilities, the theory or the process of what was called deinstitutionalization, and people could come out of hospitals. Now there's a serious question whether they were better off or not in certain ways, but these were usually people with serious major mental illnesses. And nobody wants to go back to state hospitals. You have people today who can be committed if they are a danger to themselves or others, or what's called gravely impaired. They can't take care of themselves. They can be hospitalized again against their will. Uh, some states make that easier. Some states uh, make that less difficult. That being said, there's another group of people who, if you will, are more like you and I, have emotional difficulties from time to time. They're not seriously ill in the sense that they can't work or can't uh, deal with their family effectively uh, or are the victims of uh, difficult uh, experiences, have post-traumatic stress disorders because of problems they've encountered one way or another. Now there are systems that are able to be, uh, people can make, uh, avail themselves of. Usually you have to have some kind of health insurance to be able to do that mm -hmm. because these systems have to pay people, so they gotta pay the heat and the light and the salaries. And so there has to be a health system in that regard but if you go the next step and ask me who is going to be violent? We had a terrible time and we still are recovering here in our, in our city of Buffalo. That uh, we don't know, we can't predict that. We can assess people, but we can't predict. An assessment is not a prediction. And there's simply no way to do that. Now, I think it's important to note that it is not people with emotional difficulties as such that are the violent ones. Yes, there is a concern that if you have a disease like schizophrenia and you use drugs and alcohol, violence can erupt. But the kind of targeted violence we're talking about there's no way to predict that, and the, and the mere fact of saying we need more mental health resources, of which I'm a proponent, you can always want more mental health resources, if only would that would solve the problem, which it will not. When you say you can't predict how someone's going to behave, um, how does that equate to uh, when they want to pass red flag laws or, you know, or come up with a solution that generally will apply to almost anybody uh, across the board that you know, they suspect, again, has the potential to be a harm. Uh, it, it don't a lot of people run the risk of being included uh, unfairly you know, in laws that are passed generally to quote unquote protect the public. Absolutely. You know, um, we have, if you look at motor vehicles today, we have insurance rates and drunk driving laws. Uh, you have to register your car. 
You have to get a driver's license, all kinds of ways to try and protect the, protect the public, but there's still car accidents and there's still drunk driving, but they are less than they would have been without this. And nobody's saying, no, let anybody you want drive through a red light. Uh, we don't care, though people do drive through red lights. Mm -hmm. And if we can, we apprehend them. When it becomes, and I know I'm wading into all this, uh, the fact is that the Second Amendment, if you want to have a gun, it's your right to have a gun. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they registered and protected like everything else that can be dangerous? Well, some people think that uh, when you register um, you know, with the government and the, you're giving the government power over you to take away that in some fa way or, or some situation at the government's uh, discretion. And not all people trust that the government's going to be fair. And that's some of the resistance to getting everything registered. If you're not breaking any laws, and if you don't intend to break any laws, and if you haven't broken any laws, some people, and I'm not a, a spokesman for the NRA, don't get me wrong, but I can see the logic. The logic is, if I haven't done anything wrong, why are you punishing me for something that someone else did? Why would you put a law on me that restricts me, or puts me in a position where I have to sacrifice uh, my amendment, my Second Amendment rights to, to keep and bear arms, well, you know, at the potential of the government's whims. I mean, if the government decides on the red flag law, somebody doesn't like me and says I'm an emotional problem and I should be a threat or I am a threat, the government then at their discretion with no uh, uh, do process can come in and take my guns. Well, the question is, what is a red flag? Mm -hmm. You know, if you beat your wife and you have a gun and she calls the cops, mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't have a gun sure. in the house, but I think this whole notion that the government's gonna control you, nobody minds the Eisenhower highway system when they go out and drive on the New York State Thruway. Mm -hmm. That was fine, I served in the military. Nobody says we should disband the military because they give orders in the military and it's Well, you unfair. sign up for the military. I mean, that's a, an organization Fair enough. You, you join. And if you join a country and you're a citizen, mm -hmm. somebody said we have the Statue of Liberty on the East Coast, we need a Statue of Responsibility on the West Coast. And, and there are responsibilities. And, and again, I'm not a spokesman, I don't want to get into a gun debate, but there are, it's not just with guns, but with cars and uh, with knives and with any mechanism that you can name. If you are responsible and you act responsibly and you don't hurt anyone, then well, well enough alone. But if you break the law, and there are plenty of laws that restrict you. You can't hurt someone, you can't attack someone, you can't injure someone at your discretion because you've broken a law and you will be arrested and you will be punished. Now, it, those laws are already in place. If you don't have a gun, but you have a car and you intend to do evil, you use a car or you use a baseball bat or you use a, a knife. A gun may make it easier, possibly, but that's not part of the law, whether it's easier or more difficult. People I who want to do evil will do evil, I would think. Look, I think that all of the amendments and all of our laws, to some extent, protect all of us to some extent. Sure. Everything we do has to have some kind of boundary and we have some kind of responsibility. There's nothing wrong with regulating all kinds of things. And sometimes we don't like the regulations, sometimes they're burdensome, sometimes the government does make mistakes and make silly mistakes as well. And, but at the same time, there's 330 million people. We've got to get along some way in a way that benefits as many people as we can with the least amount of restriction. I don't think there's anything wrong. Right. 
But note I said the least amount of restriction. I did not say no restriction. Agreed. Agreed. And I agree that restrictions apply. Uh, and I would venture to say that restrictions apply to government as well as people. Uh, we won't be, we won't do well and we won't through, thrive if government is not restricted. That's the principle of well, you which restrict, we were, yeah, we were, you, we you were restrict, uh, founded. Yeah, of course. And the way government is, works on the consent of the government. Right. The government, you don't like somebody, you know what? Vote don't vote out. for them. <laughs> Absolutely. That's don't the system. vote for them. Now, That's there's the a question why people don't vote. That's an interesting That's issue. Enough. And that is a question that we will discuss the next time I have you here. <laughs> <laughs> because this has been a fascinating discussion. But unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm being told by my boss over here that I have to wrap it up. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Joseph, this has been tremendous. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. And we're going to have to do this again. I'd love to come back and just remember, you invited me. <laughs> we'll see you next time on The Big Picture.